at ourselves the last few months because the level of care they require on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there's not enough hours in the day for what we need to do for the boys, really. It's very hard to explain to people how tough the past year has been. Um, we've faced losing our precious little boys twice. It's quite stressful, I suppose, but I think what keeps myself and Esdeen going is, I suppose, first of all, our humour throughout all this. You know, we've just maintained humour somehow. Um, but, you know, we kind of always just look to the future and even though right now we're killing ourselves and, you know, trying our best to maintain, you know, a top level of care for the boys and their needs, we always just, you know, look to the future, I suppose, and we might work hard now and, you know, put all the effort in now, but please God, in the future, you know, we're going to see the benefits of all our hard work. <laughs> well, Hassan and Hussein are with us now and their mother, their very busy mother, Angie ben Hafaf. It's lovely to have you with us. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having us. And for letting us into your home to see what daily life is like. Hectic, as we yeah, can see. Yeah, it was a lovely time though. We had a nice day doing that. Ha now tell us, how are the boys? They're wonderful, what can I say? Um, this time last year, if somebody had told me that we'd have had a week like this, and that our two little treasures were just having so much fun and being typical boys, you know, I wouldn't have believed it. But um, they're doing wonderful, thank God. A lot of hard work to, I suppose, get them to this stage, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we do a lot of hard work and physio and, yeah. you so, know, so loads. What, what time do you get up in the morning? About 6 a.m. 6 a.m. What time do you get to bed at night? <laughs> <laughs> Two o'clock if I'm lucky, <laughs> 2 a.m. Two in the morning. Yeah. And it's yeah. just constant physiotherapy appointments, dealing with all of the, the issues that yeah. the boys still have. And of course, you've, you've two girls as well. Yeah, and we're trying to, you know, give the, the girls, I suppose, a sense of normality and time away from clinics and appointments as well. Like last week, I had eight appointments in one week, you know, and the girls had to come to most of those. So... This week was lovely now, just a time away from hospitals and clinics. Your dad is not here, go in there. <laughs> <laughs> Loves their dad. And, uh, are, the, are the girls then very protective of the lads, are they? Very protective, yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose Malik is very motherly towards them and very gentle, whereas Eman, you know, the younger one, she's a bit rough and tumble and um, <laughs> I'd be scared some days, you know. She's three and a half. Yeah, but she's very protective if, if people come to us outside to say hello to the boys. Like, she's straight away in front of the buggy and scolding people, you know, and checking them out. Yeah. yeah. They're wonderful. Just listen to your story, and of course your, your book is out, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but she, you've been through so much yourself, you and your husband. I mean, from... The moment that you found out that the boys were conjoined, I'm sure it was a complete roller coaster from, from then on. Yeah. I sometimes think how could all that happen in such a short time? It was just such a roller coaster of emotions, most of it most of it bad, you know. There were a few highs, you know, and when there were highs they were amazing, you know. Did you get an awful shock when you were told the news the first time? Yeah, I mean I did have a feeling that um <coughs> I don't know what I he's up to there. Feeling, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, you know, and they love stealing the lime like these two, you know. <laughs> I mean, I said a year ago they'd give Jedward a run for their money. Sure. <laughs> Jedward back there somewhere now. <laughs> but but it, it, isn't it amazing when you think of bank bailouts, when you think of recessions, when you think of yeah. all you hear is 70 billion here and 70 yeah. billion there. And then you look at these two guys here. They're a breath of fresh air. Um, no matter... You know, some mornings we wake up and I suppose it's hard to face the day because it t days are tough and it's tiring and the boys' routine is, is a big strain on me and Az, you know. They have different medicines of different times every day. They're in sitting prosthetics that have to go on throughout the day. They're in um, a second skin um, suit that has to be worn throughout the day as well to keep the spine straight. Um, physio has to be done every day at home by us if they're not at Enable Ireland, who are a wonderful support to us. And um, it's tough going, but then you look at the two of them and you just see this huge reward smiling <laughs> back at you, you know? But what about support? Because um, Azadine hasn't been able to return to work because there's so much work to do at yeah. home. So it must be tough. It's tough. I mean, I suppose, ideally, we would have loved Az to return to work by now. Um, 
but you know, Enable Ireland said, you know, it's hard enough for families who have one child with a significant disability, but when you have twice that, you need yeah. twice the level of care. Mm. And um, with two of us doing it at the moment, I suppose there's, um, we still don't have enough hands, you know, to do all what needs to be done, but we're, we're doing our best. And, um, you know, we know that in a few years time, please God, when we see them running around, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, wrecking their sister's heads, you know, <laughs> and we'll know why we did all the hard work and we'll see our rewards then, you know. And in, in terms of, of running around then, that's going to involve a trip to the States, I understand. Um, well, we're hoping now um, that the doctor's going to come to us. We believe that he comes to Ireland once okay. a year from the States and we hope to meet with him in the summer, which is all kind of up in the air still, you know. Um, this is for the prosthetic limb that each yeah. of the boys yeah. needs. Because the boys are missing half pelvis each, they need a specialised prosthetic. Otherwise, it could be got locally or in Europe, you know. But um, they need to have a specialist prosthetic made that, you know, has a half pelvis kind of built in to maintain the level of support they require, you know. Cool. And your book is out at the moment. It is. A wonderful book. Were, Good were, you, read. were you on Ryan Tower this morning? I was just I was. Lovely stuff. I but was. See, we heard that now as well. <laughs> keeping an eye on you. And the book was therapy in itself, I'd say. Was it getting it, it all was. out there? I mean, for me, I suppose, um, myself and Asdi never had time for counselling or, you know, to talk through, I suppose, everything that had happened to us through a difficult pregnancy, traumatic birth, you know, again, for the separation, complete roller coaster. So for me, writing the book was a huge form of therapy, you know, and I felt that I was getting it all on paper and I had kept a diary throughout that time and uh, it guides me with the book as well, you know. Sure so I did, you forget, tend to forget things. Angie, thank you so much for coming thank in you. Thank you. and for bringing the boys with you. It's great to see the them so well. Back. Oh, they are. They're having great fun. <laughs> Angie's incredible story is all documented in her book, which is called Little Fighters and it's priced at 14 99 now calling all Winnie the Pooh fans, we're giving away 1,000 tickets nationwide to see one of the world's most loved bears. So for your chance to see this family classic for free, <laughs> have a look at this. What's the madness here? <laughs> a simple hello would do. Thank you very much. To celebrate the release of the family classic Winnie the Pooh, The Daily Show has teamed up with Walt Disney Animation Studios to offer you the chance to see it first for free before its official release on the 15th of April. Inspired by three stories from A.A. Milne's books and narrated by John Cleese, this all-new movie reunites audiences with the honey-loving philosophical bear and friends Tigger, Rabbit, Piglet, Owl, Kanga, Roo and Eeyore in a wild quest to save Christopher Robin from an imaginary culprit. This exclusive screening is this Sunday morning, the 10th of April, in seven cinemas across the country. You can apply for your free tickets in two ways. You can log on to our website, that's rte.ie forward slash tv forward slash the daily show and fill in the form provided. Or you can post your ticket request to movie ticket giveaway, the daily show, RTE Donnybrook Dublin 4. Each successful applicant will receive four tickets. Please remember to include a daytime contact number and mark clearly the venue of the screening you would like to attend. The screenings will take place in Savoy Dublin, Omniplex Cork, the Odeon Belfast, Omniplex Galway, Omniplex Limerick, Omniplex Kilkenny and Gaiety Sligo. Tickets will be allocated between internet and postal applications on a first-come, first-served basis. Successful applicants will receive confirmation. Full terms and conditions are available on our website. No. His dulcet tones have been entertaining GAA fans for over 60 years. No match would be complete without his smooth delivery and witty commentary. Here's a reminder of the man behind the mic. Away in Tibet, who started it all, 90 off down the field. He had it again, and he's and drove to the lip. High in the air, not a confident kick by any means. Off the upright, breaks out of Massey. Massey, a chance of a goal, and he's got it. Tomas Massey, in from Dublin. It came out of nothing. Cork had not finished yet. Cork had not had it. Tried to get inside. Gives it out to Niall McCarthy. McCarthy slipped. He gets up two Kilkenny men at the shoulder. He's gone inside them. He gets a crossing ball. Ben Lohan. 
Will you miss not, not being involved as much this year? In the championship? Well, I have to wait till the championship comes, but I'll be going to the games. Yes. And I always went to see a game number one. Looked forward to the game, enjoyed the game. Happened to be speaking about it at the same time. I'll be going this time, but I'll be maybe silent. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, any time I go to Crow Park, I always go early at about 12 o'clock in the day after the match with the Sunday papers and sit inside in Crow Park on a Sunday before yeah. the minor yeah. match starts. I usually get to meet me hall as well because... You have your dinner I, at the I, start of the day, do yeah, you? Straight from yeah. at the day. Yeah. But I'd always go over. But it, it's quite amazing even being inside in Crow Park yeah. when there's no one there before all the big uh, crowd comes in. I think to appreciate what an All-Ireland final is or any other big game, you should be there long before the yeah. event to see it developing. Yeah. The early comers, you know, like generally looking at the ground, they're yeah. thinking of the day ahead <laughs> and arriving early and experiencing the whole lot from start to finish. So how has your life been since September uh, with this well, big change in terms same of Same as ever. I've been at lots of club functions and different functions. I've been over in England, I've been in New York, I've been in Toronto, I've been in Hong Kong. You were Grand All Marshal for the Toronto I was St. Patrick's indeed, Day Parade. Yeah. Held the Sunday before Patrick's Day, because Patrick's Day is not a public holiday there, mm -hmm. but it was a fantastic week. Yeah. You know, I never knew that the Irish are so well organised in Toronto. We all know about Boston, Chicago, New York, you know, Australia, London and all this, but not Toronto, but they've been going there for hundreds of years and very well organised there now. Lots and lots of new Irish out there. Yeah. And the wonderful thing from what I saw, there was a big welcome event organised for them all. And they came, they're very confident young people, very well qualified, but the local associations acquainted them where work was available, what they should be wary of and all that. And in no time at all, they had exchanged email addresses and Facebook details. <laughs> and they were a community in no time. Mm -hmm. and whatever you say about the modern media of communication, they are very useful in yeah. cases like Certainly that. Certainly are. And you came home to Michal to be part yeah. of the St. Patrick's Day Festival yeah, in Killarney. But uh, it was a very busy week in Toronto. I yeah. visited the university where Irish had been taught. Uh, the Canada Ireland Fund had a, a fundraiser with 1,200 people at it. Yeah. Business people that paid a lot of money. And again, they sponsored the table for the new arrivals, mm -hmm. which was yeah. great. Mm -hmm. And uh, Enterprise Ireland were there and yeah. promoting the, the, business. The, the, and Canada so have their first Rochdas this year, don't they, I think? They do indeed. Yeah. And uh, very, very much connected with here. There was the Grand Marshal Ball, all the associations and... They hadn't a hurling team in 20 years, but 22 hurlers paraded in the parade. A bit, See, like, the a bit like County Leash, me. Ah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're, they're there from everywhere. And good hurlers. I'm and they, they've organised that they'll have another 18 before the season well, starts. You see, Michal, I suppose that for... for Overseas countries is a, yeah. is a benefit, but you've seen the GAA operating yes. through recessions in the past, and we see now, and I saw in the Irish Times today, yeah. clubs losing players clubs to losing emigration. Clubs losing players and county panels losing players as well, and it's not the first time it happened, but you don't like to see it happening, and they don't like going, but in a way, they're adventurous. If they can't get work here, like, like the bus going to England... Yeah they're going to where the work is. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's sad to see good players leaving. And then, of good course, players, yes. some clubs around the country have debt yeah. problems that they're facing. They do, yeah. But it's also great for them that there is a GA club, no matter where they go. There yeah. are 400 GA clubs outside of Ireland now. There's a strong one in Toronto. There's a Canadian board and yeah. New York board they, and wherever they, they, they go. They clubs in Qatar now and everything. They have it's indeed. It's unreal. I've been in Hong Kong at, you know football functions since the All-Ireland final. There were lots of clubs yeah. in Asia now. And it's Mi great to have them. Michal, Mi as a Kerry man, from one Kerry man to another, I have to ask you a very, very dangerous question. Who's a dangerous question. A very dangerous yeah. question. Who's, who, who would you rate as the greatest footballer of all time? Well, it's, you know, there are different eras yeah. and different parts of the field. For instance, how would a goalkeeper be if he was transferred up to full forward? Yeah. I've often said, you know, that it's an unfair thing to be doing comparing player, but... I always, he was a great friend of mine, Sean Purcell of Galway, Mick O'Connell of Kerry, Jack O'Shea of Kerry and Tommy Murphy of Leash. There you I go. had one of Kerry's greatest midfielders ever. I mentioned him already, Paddy Kennedy. Yeah. He, always said, <laughs> he always said he was the greatest player he played on or ever saw. Mm -hmm. Now that's from a man, yeah. And the best match? The best match, the best hurling match I saw was definitely last year's All-Ireland yeah. Hurling ah. 
from start to finish, skill, pace, atmosphere, everything. Great endeavor, great discipline, yeah. sportsmanship, a lot. That, quality hurling from start yeah. to finish. There isn't a game in the world that could compare and, with that. And echoes of 19.